Hi class. Welcome to lecture 1.3 financial statements, taxes, and cash flow. First I'd like to start by talking about four key concepts that I would like you to understand by the end of this lecture. The first is to understand the difference between book value and market value. Now book value is really nothing more than the historic purchase price of uh, an asset. So what did you originally pay to acquire that asset? Market value is more what could I sell it for today? There's a major difference between those two and in my opinion book value has a whole lot more to do with accounting whereas market value will have a whole lot more to do with finance and I'll explain that more throughout the lecture. Speaking of accounting uh, I'd also like you to know the difference between accounting income and cash flow. Now accounting income really talks more about the net income after you've paid taxes and and any other things that might be used to decrease the amount of income that you owe for taxes such as depreciation also you have some interest considerations whereas cash flow really refers to actual money on hand so what money does the company actually have to say give back to shareholders or to spend on purchasing new plant property or equipment or maybe even new inventory to sell. So one of the major concepts for that second point is to really understand the difference between cash items and non-cash items like depreciation that will drastically change the way that uh, we look at specific financial statements. We're also going to look at the difference between average and marginal tax rates. A lot of people are somewhat confused at what tax rate they would actually pay and so hopefully after the today's lecture you'll have a better understanding there. Average though is really taking an average right so you're going to take the total amount of tax that you've paid divided by your total income whereas marginal tax rates are really just talking about the amount of tax payable on the next dollar earned. Okay, So what tax bracket, what marginal tax bracket are you currently in? And then how to determine a firm's cash flow from its financial statements. Cash flow is obviously an extremely big topic uh, in finance and we will delve somewhat into that topic into this class and even into this lecture. But hopefully it won't get too confusing. So once again these are the four concepts that I would like you to learn after completing this lecture. The balance sheet is one of the main financial statements that any student should know when studying finance. Sometimes at this point I like to embarrass myself and say shake it like a Polaroid picture and obviously I butchered that but nonetheless the point is is that the balance sheet is very much like a Polaroid picture. It's a snapshot of a firm at one moment in time. We're also going to talk about the income statement later and it's more like a video recording over a period of time. So once again, the balance sheet is a snapshot of what the firm's current structure looks like at one specific moment in time. On the left-hand side of a balance sheet, you would see the assets, and on the right-hand side, you see the liabilities and owner's equity. That goes back to that basic fundamental accounting equation that assets equals liabilities plus stockholders' equity or owner's equity, however you want to say it. One interesting point to point out is that assets are usually listed in order of decreasing liquidity. So for example cash would be the most liquid so it would be listed first. You have accounts receivables then you will have any other current assets up to inventory then you're going to get into your fixed assets such as plant property and equipment. We will also talk a little bit about intangible and tangible assets so you may have some intangible assets like brands that are also listed in there. On the right hand side you would start with liabilities and they're going to be listed in the order of which one has to be paid first. So your current liabilities would go before your long term liabilities and the one that has got to be paid off first is the one that's going to be listed higher. So if you've got an accounts payable uh, that's due within the next three months it would obviously be higher than a 30 year loan that you've taken out with a bank. Regardless of which order items are listed, all the assets on the left hand side do have to balance with all the liabilities and owner's equity on the right side. That is the reason we call it the balance sheet. This figure right here should show you an illustration of what a balance sheet would look like. 
you're going to have obviously the assets on the left and the liabilities and the shareholders equity on the right the one neat thing that this figure shows in my opinion is it, it really does a good job of explaining networking capital networking capital is an equation that everybody should memorize obviously you don't have to memorize it this is kind of an online class but networking capital is current assets minus current liabilities it's a short-term equation and lets you kind of look at whether or not the company looks good from a financial standpoint especially in the short term another thing I like to mention is the difference between tangible and intangible assets obviously a tangible asset would be like a if you're a UPS company you may have some trucks you may even have some airplanes or, or whatnot you're obviously gonna have some warehouses and things of that nature these are actual real assets that you can find and you could possibly uh, put a price tag on and sell very tangible you can touch them intangible assets though are often hard to put your finger on they're not necessarily you, you know that I can go right out and touch them uh, examples are trademarks and patents so if you think about like Microsoft and their Windows trademark or Coke uh, you know Coca-Cola Classic or Nike with the swoosh um, you know Michael Jordan's silhouette on Air Jordan shoes or if you look at your own calculator you'll see a funny looking shape of Texas with a lowercase i for Texas Instruments all of these are examples of trademarks that companies have put a, a value on and you may see them on the balance sheet uh, trademarks can be very powerful I think there's an, uh, one of the really powerful examples comes from college football it wasn't too long ago if you think about uh, the Big Ten and the Big 12 both spent tons of money branding their conferences as Big Ten or Big 12 uh, but mathematically you think <laughs> that something was wrong because the Big Ten for a while there had 12 schools and the Big 12 still has 10 schools so one of the interesting things is that um, even though those numbers change that those schools try to hold on to that specific number because it was wrapped up in years and years and years of branding and tradition moving on to the next slide about the balance sheet you will see that it says networking capital at the top and we've already talked about networking capital as the current assets minus current liabilities so this is the equation and it usually is a healthy sign for a company if that number is positive so anything above zero is what you would hope for so that would mean that you're technically covered from a short-term perspective however how high would you want that number to be well we will talk about that number once again when we're talking about ratios we talk about the current ratio um, it's a similar idea as networking capital but in it instead puts current assets over current liabilities nonetheless you definitely want it to be positive however you might not want it too high and we'll talk about that in a little bit You've also heard me mention liquidity, and just to make sure everybody's on the same page, this is how fast you can get rid of something or sell it, and you know whether or not you can sell it for what it's worth. When times get tough, sometimes it's really important to have liquidity. This is why after that last recession, major recession in the 2007-2008 period, a lot of companies began to hold quite a bit of cash on hand just in case they needed it because of any potential financial distress in the future. A good example of liquidity would be the difference between having a pawn shop and having a tree farm. You know, everything in a pawn shop should be priced pretty much to, to go. Very liquid assets are in a pawn shop. People bring those stuff in, and you know, the owner of that pawn shop would like to flip that stuff uh, at a reasonable profit. But it's very, very liquid items. However, a tree farm is one of the more illiquid investments you can make because real estate first off is very illiquid but then also growing trees is extremely illiquid if you're going to wait and properly harvest them sometimes that can take uh, that process can take decades that being said I should note that liquid assets often earn a lower return so if you think about cash cash isn't going to make you much money you put it in a money market fund it's going to make you a little bit more maybe a CD or something in that nature you put it in bonds you know maybe not in today's market but usually bonds should make you even a little bit more and then you start getting into different types of stocks and they should give you a better return and then there are very illiquid investments some hedge funds if you were an affluent investor would require you to give a lot of money up front and then might not be able to pay you back for uh, months or a year down the road 
and then you get into even some real estate and uh, long-term projects that could be even more liquid. So there should definitely be a trade-off between liquidity and return, just like there's a trade-off between risk and return because liquidity is somewhat of a measure of risk. Now, two slides ago, you, show, you saw the oldest accounting equation of all time, assets equals liabilities plus shareholders' equity. In this, I'm just reminding you that you can also rearrange that equation to look at what is equity. What is an equity in a firm? Really what shareholders have the right to are all the assets minus the liabilities, right? So usually debt holders in any kind of a firm or any kind of situation of a liquidation process would get paid off first. What the remaining amount is, that's really the shareholders' equity. Because debt holders get paid off before shareholders, shareholders are very concerned about debt. And the use of debt can be a good thing or a bad thing. Financial leverage can be used and it can be abused. So it can magnify both gains and losses. So if you want to see what a real balance sheet looks like, we will switch to the next slide. Okay, so what you see here is a balance sheet for a U.S. corporation. And one of the interesting things about this balance sheet is that it actually is kind of two balance sheets merged together. You see both 2009 and 2010. And the reason I like to use this is because this reminds me to point out that there really are only two good ways to measure how well a company is doing and from a performance standpoint. One is over time, which you'll see that there is some time comparison here, 2009 to 2010, and then also amongst competitors or an industry average of some sort. However, when you're looking for some kind of a peer group or you know some kind of a competitor to make a comparison, that's not always easy because some companies aren't exactly like other companies. They may have different uh, niche or niche areas that they prefer to operate in. Uh, they also might have different um, different regions of the country that they operate in, or even you know different countries. Period. One example is Adidas versus Nike. Now, these are two both very big athletic apparel companies. However, Nike has made quite a large foothold in the United States, whereas Adidas is usually more reserved. Um, for the European markets um, and also Adidas has a pretty big foothold in the soccer industry as well so who would we want to compare with Nike maybe Under Armour since they're you know more into the American marketplace well Under Armour is much smaller than Nike so once again make, making those comparisons although they probably would help are not going to be perfect there is going to be it's going to be very hard to find an apples to apples comparison for a lot of companies. Also, it can be hard to find the information. You know, Hershey's versus Mars. These are two what you know might appear like candy stores, right? Hershey's obviously makes chocolate. Mars obviously makes chocolate. Um, however, Mars is private, and it might be difficult to find the information on them. Also, Mars is a company that makes a great deal of its money more from the pet food side of its business than even from the candy side. And that's not something that most people know, but when you get in to compare these companies, you will see that making comparison between Mars and Hershey will be difficult because the availability of information won't be there. You know, Mars is, is a very big company. I think it's the sixth largest private company in America. However, that information might not be as readily available as it would be on Hershey. Now looking more closely at the U.S. corporation balance sheet here, you will see that the assets still balance with the liabilities and owner's equity for each year. You have $2,756 in total assets for 2009, $2,756 of liabilities and owner's equity for 2009. For, two, for 2010, you have $3,112 in both assets and also in liabilities and owner's equity. Now, usually when you're making a comparison over time, you like to look at more than just one year difference. However, there is some information we could obtain here. We could see that their total assets are increasing. We could see that also their liability and owner's equity are, are increasing. However, how are they financing this increase in assets? Is it through debt or through equity? Let's take a look. If you look, you will see that 
current liabilities actually decreased a little bit. So from a short-term liability standpoint, they actually have less liabilities. However, their long-term debt went up a good bit. So, you know, they now have $46 million and more long-term debt as of 2010. However, the more impressive number is when looking at their owner's equity, which actually increased by over $300 million. So this obviously should be good news for the shareholders. Switching gears from the balance sheet, let's make sure that we really understand the difference between market and book value. Book value is the historical purchase price of an asset. So we're talking about what was recorded on the actual balance sheet back in the day, right? So, um, and that historical value is going to stay on balance sheets for not only assets, but also for liabilities and equity. So that is your book value. However, what you could sell assets for or what liabilities or equity can actually be bought or sold for, those are the market values. Once again, a lot of accounting decisions and accounting reporting is done using book value. A lot of financial decisions uh, are, ba are based off of market value. For example, if I say a company has increased in value, I'm usually referring to its market value, not its book value. There are a lot of examples I could give here. Some of my favorites are talking about, like, say, cars, for example. If you look at a very old car, uh, maybe it's a Pinto. Well, that might not be, you know, worth as much today as when you bought it. So its actual book value might be higher than its current market value. Whereas if it's a Stingray, there's a very good chance that its market value is a lot higher than the book value. So whether or not it's an antique car or a collector's car or whatnot uh, can have a major difference on uh, the market value versus the book value. In other words, we're talking about you know ideas such as appreciation, depreciation, inflation. Uh, there's a lot of factors at play here. Another one of my favorite examples is about Don Perignon, a 17th century monk who actually came up with champagne, right, from France. Well, watching the show Pawn Stars, I really liked one episode where a collector came in to sell a bottle of the original year 1921 of Don Perignon. He believed that this bottle was worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $100,000. Well, they brought in an expert, an expert analyzed it, and much to the shock of the collector, he told them that the bottle was worthless. So, and within a few seconds, um, this value, this market value for this bottle had changed drastically from $100,000 to, to $0. So the market value can change really quickly, right? Whereas the book value is what he paid for it you know, assuming that he had it on a balance sheet of some kind. Now, why is this? Well, it turns out that unlike wine, which actually does get better with age, champagne is carbonated, and so at some point, it, the you know, the, the carbonation will make the champagne actually not worth drinking. So, in, in some essence, he, you know, whoever owned this bottle waited way too long to, to buy it. Now, does it have some value? Maybe somebody wants to bottle or something, but uh, nonetheless, I don't think it's going to sell for $100,000. One final example are railroads. You know, if you think about railroad companies, they've been out around for a very long time. Now, railroads have a lot of land assets on their books. Why? They bought up a lot of land to put, you know, the railroad tracks through. Now, this land, when they purchased it, was far cheaper than what it would be worth today if they sold it. So, in a lot of ways, the book value of railroad companies will look substantially lower than their actual market value because they hold some very valuable land assets. For example, if you take a look at this Klingon Corporation balance sheet, obviously that's a ode to you Star Trek fans out there, right? I kind of almost wanted to say Star Wars just to make somebody go crazy, but obviously it's Star Trek, right? If you look, what you'll see on this balance sheet, instead of breaking it up by time, it's broken it up as a book column and a market column. And one of the things that you will notice here is that the assets are worth more from a market value standpoint than from a book value standpoint. But if you're going to balance it that way, you got to balance it the other way as well. So uh, you can balance a, 
a, a balance sheet using both book values and market values. Now how would you go about balance, balancing the right side of a balance sheet from a market value standpoint? Well this gets us to the idea of a plug variable. In this case uh, knowing what the market value of your assets are, $1,600, you have to put that as your total for debt and equity under the market value column. You also will know what your long-term debt is. I mean, it is fixed. You notice $500 for book and $500 for market value. However, equity is the plug variable. So in this case, since your, your long-term debt didn't go up, you get to add all of that extra value in the form of equity. So the equity made a big jump from $600 to $1,100. In other words, the actual market value of shares is almost double what is shown on the books from a book value perspective. So I think this is a good time to switch from the idea of balance sheets, which are once again that snapshot in time, to more of a video stream over a period of time, which we will call the income statement. The income statement is a statement that's going to measure performance over a specific period of time. You know, a lot of times we'll look at just an annual income statement, but it could be over, you know, like a quarter or a month or pretty much any period. But it has a, you know, a starting time and an end time, not just one moment in time like a balance sheet. Just like a balance sheet, though, this is going to be a financial statement that's usually prepared using generally accepted accounting principles, sometimes called GAAP, uh, and there are going to be specific rules for how you will actually create an income statement. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to find out what are your revenues, right? So what's the revenue model for this company or whatnot? How much, when I talk about revenues, what we're really talking about are sales. What were your sales? And then after that, you're going to take out any costs that were associated with those revenues so that you can figure out how much money you're making. The end result or bottom line is often called net income. Sometimes that's also called earnings. So in this class, anytime you see uh, an E, be careful of whether or not we're talking about equity or earnings. Uh, sometimes it's safer to write NI for net income. But net income and earnings should be the, the same thing. Now, from that, once you have your net income, you have to remember when I uh, showed you guys that uh, figure that had a whole bunch of arrows, A, B, C, D, E, F, and it showed you where all cash flows were going. Well, one of the things about net income is now that you've got it, you have to decide where to go. Should you plug it back into the company so that the company can grow? That's called retained earnings. Or should you kick it out to your shareholders in the form of dividends? So that's why you get that income statement equation at the bottom. Net income is going to be uh, revenues minus expenses. However, if I was going to also throw an equation on there for net income, I could say net income is equal to dividends plus retained earnings, right? So in some cases, you can look at net income as the final stop in an income statement, or you can say that there's actually one more step if you want to talk about what happens to that net income. Are you going to you know, use it to grow the company in the form of retained earnings, or are you going to kick that money back out to the shareholders? Sometimes it's easier to show you an income statement than talk about one. So let's take a look. Almost every income statement will work this way, and I, it would probably be in your best interest to kind of memorize the flow of a net income statement. You're going to start with sales, then you're going to go to costs, and you know a lot of times that's called cost of goods sold, or what I would write is maybe just CGS for cost of goods sold, and then you're also going to take up depreciation. So you'd have your net sales, you would in this case that'd be the 1509. Then you subtract out the 750, and subtract out the 65 of depreciation, and then you have what's called EBIT or earnings before interest and taxes then you take out the interest that you paid on your debt and now what you would have is your earnings before taxes okay we all have to pay taxes so then after you take out the taxes what's left over is your net income now if you notice uh, there's a double line there for net income because a lot of times that's where an income statement will stop but you can then further break that down into how much of that in net income goes to dividends and how much goes to retained earnings. In this case, 103 goes to dividends and 309 goes to retained earnings. One important observation to make is where is depreciation? You notice that it is right after cost of goods sold, meaning it's before taxes. So although depreciation is kind of a, a non-cash item, meaning that we're not technically having to pay for it, uh, it 
it gives you somewhat of a tax break because it comes before taxes. So this is one of the advantages of depreciation as somewhat of a tax shield. So once again, you'll hear me mention this gap, generally accepted accounting principles. Well, there is a matching principle with the income statements. And essentially what you have to do here is recognize revenue when it accrues. You also have to match expenses required to generate revenue to the same income statement, not necessarily the same year. In other words, if you build boats and it takes you 15 years to build a boat, uh, and then you sell it in that year, then you want to match those costs and the sales in the same year. Also recall that I just explained that depreciation was an interesting observation. Well, it falls under the category of non-cash items. And the reason this is important is because depreciation doesn't necessarily affect your cash flow. So one major point is that you could have a negative net income but still have a positive cash flow because you let depreciation reduce uh, your revenues to the point that after taxes you did not have a positive net income. In other words, accounting income and cash flows are not necessarily the same and they can very easily be different. And one of those main reasons why is depreciation. I'd also like to take a minute to talk about time and cost. Now, fixed versus variable cost is a concept that not everybody really understands. Obviously, your fixed costs are static and your variable costs will change based on whatever it is that your business does and how much of that product that you sell or service that you do. But another way of saying that is, you know, sometimes you can say that, well, in some cases, all costs are variable because uh, eventually, you know, you're going to even replace things like uh, a plant or something like that as well, right? So uh, don't get too hung up on the ideas of fixed versus variable cost. I think an example here could probably explain it pretty well. My dad is an OBGYN. He runs his own practice. Now, he's one of the few doctors that still does, even with uh, the regulations getting tougher to understand. Now, he has a lot of fixed costs, so much so that if he only worked about a 40-hour work week like normal people, he would make no money because 40 hours of work for him barely covers his fixed costs, which pay for you know the, the payments on his loans for building his practice, uh, property taxes, and for a lot of other costs that he's going to have to pay regardless of how much he works. Now, his variable cost and in some ways will change based on how much he works. And so, you know, how many patients he sees might depend on how often he needs his employees to come in and, and what their salary structure should look like, um, how much of different supplies that they're going to have to run through. Um, you know, so, a, so variable costs could change quite a bit depending on how many hours he decides to work in a week. Now, he's a workaholic. He works closer to like 80 hours a week. Um, so... You know, the 40 hours a week will cover his fixed cost, and then, you know, maybe another 20 hours covers his variable cost. And so those last 20 hours are where he makes all of his money. And he makes a good bit of money, but that's only because he understands the difference between uh, fixed cost and variable cost. And he's willing to make the sacrifice to make sure that he clears his variable cost, too, by quite a bit. I'd also like to talk about earnings management. Now, there you'll see there that one idea is smoothing earnings and another is this idea of wiggle room. All I really want you to understand here is that the accounting practices do leave uh, some ability to maneuver numbers to where they are somewhat smoothed out over time or whether or not you take losses in a, you know one specific period versus another so that uh, a lot of times what your these CEOs or anybody involved in earnings management is trying to do is just to show steadily increasing earnings because that's what investors like to see. Little drops, you know, and big drops really scare investors. If you're interested more about some of the information on publicly traded companies, once again, you can work the web. You can find all kinds of information about companies such as their 10Ks and, a, a, you know, a wealth of uh, financial statements on uh, the SEC websites at edgar.gov is a really good website that's going to give you the, this information. If you can't find this information and you want to find it for a specific company, let me know and I will show you exactly how to get that specific information. 
Now let's move away from financial statements and let's talk about another topic, taxes. There are two different areas of taxes that are, or two different categories of taxes that I want you to understand. The first is the marginal tax. Uh, marginal tax is often associated with marginal tax brackets and this is the uh, percentage of tax that's paid on the next dollar earned. So if you earn a uh, $104,000 well, your marginal tax rate will be the rate you would earn, you know, the tax rate you would have to pay on that, uh, on the next dollar, so $104,001. Whereas your average tax rate is simply by taking the total amount of taxes that you paid and dividing it by your total taxable income. So another way of saying average is to say uh, the percentage of income that goes to taxes, right? That's your average tax rate. So let's look at this uh, question here. If I'm considering a project that will increase tax school, taxable income by $1 million, which tax rate should I use in my analysis? Although the answer to this question may seem somewhat confusing, the answer really here is probably better your marginal tax rate. And the reason being is because you need to go through each of the brackets. And so you'd really want to see uh, where this next $1 million is coming through in the tax brackets. I'll show you what I mean with an example here in just a second. However, I do want to point out that this is a really important macro topic as well. Uh, this, If you understand marginal versus average tax rates, this might help you understand some policy decisions as far as uh, marginal tax breaks and uh, also you know tax breaks for the poor. For example, it's very hard to have a income tax cut just for the poor with uh, one of the reasons for this is because everybody goes through the same tax bracket so if you make a tax cut in the lowest tax bracket you're more than likely making that tax cut for everybody because even Bill Gates has to go through the first tax bracket before they get to the second marginal tax bracket and on and on and on uh, there's also the argument of a flat tax and some of you may not know what that is but that is where there would be only one marginal tax bracket for example everybody would pay 25 percent a lot of people um, don't believe this is fair. They believe that the wealthy should pay a higher percentage of taxes. Uh, however, a lot of people believe that this would create an incentive for uh, the rich to work hard to stay rich, uh, for the poor to work harder to become rich. And, um, and so you've got to find the right balance there, and I think that's a lot about what our uh, tax policy is about. Now getting back to the example that I promised, let's take a look at marginal versus average rates. And let's suppose your firm earns $4 million in taxable income. Well, I have three questions here for you to answer. First, what is that firm's tax liability? Second, what is the average tax rate? And third, what is the marginal tax rate? As you can see on this slide, I have broken down this answer for you in an Excel spreadsheet. Now. What's important to understand is, and this is one of the strange and almost, you know, just pure coincidence cases where the average rate and the marginal rate both came up as 34%. That almost never happens. Uh, one of the reasons for that, though, is in this case is simply the fact that uh, if you notice the tax rates, look at that middle column called tax rates, you go 15% in the first marginal bracket, 25%, second, 34%, and the third, 39%, and then you go back down to 34%. Uh, so there's, it's not truly progressive, meaning that it just gets higher and higher and higher. It actually kind of dips back down for a little bit, and the highest bracket is actually that 39% bracket. Now, why does it do this, you might ask? Well, um, you know, I'm not saying that today's current marginal tax brackets are exactly like this example, but I will say that mathematically there's not really a whole lot of reason for that except there's probably a lot of compromise and back and forth on Capitol Hill. And uh, this is where they um, you know, decided these brackets should be. So we have a progressive tax system, but it doesn't mean it is continually progressive. Or I should say has to be, because it could be if they wanted to make it that way. But... Uh, especially after we get past the $100,000 mark, there is a lot of gray territory as to what people should actually be taxed. But back to our original example, let's look at the tax liability on $4 million. What you will see in the blue columns is that one of the first things you want to do is break down your taxable income. So the first bracket is marginal bracket is for zero to fifty thousand dollars those are the taxable income levels the tax rates fifteen percent so 
uh, you would take 15% times $50,000 and that's where that tax liability of 7500 comes up on that first row. On the second row you will see you go from $50,001 to $75,000. So this is a $25,000 total marginal tax bracket. So the second marginal tax bracket is at 25%. You take 25% multiply it by $25,000 and you get $6,250. You'll do this over and over through all the brackets till you run out of money. So in the third bracket you go from $75,001 to $100,000. So once again that's another $25,000 tax bracket. So you multiply 34% times $25,000 $5,000 of taxable income, you get $8,500. In the fourth bracket, you get a big jump of, of taxable income levels from $100,001 to $335,000. And this is also a big jump in tax rates, right? Uh, or I should say, at least it's at the highest tax rate uh, in this problem, right? So now you have $235,000 worth of taxable income at 39%. So you will see your tax liability jump up enormously to 91,650, right? So a lot of times when the rich say, uh, you know, they feel like they're paying more, it's a lot of times it's because they are, right? Now, whether or not they should be, that's a different discussion. Okay, now, uh, you still have a little bit of money left over, right? Well, technically, I actually got a lot. So if you look, you look at the 335,000, right? You still got to get all the way up to 4 million. Well, that whole next bracket will include that. So how do I decide how much I should include as far as taxable income in this bracket? Well, you would take $4 million and you will subtract 335000 right? Because you have already been taxed on your first $335,000 of income. That would leave you with $3,665,000, okay? So this, the taxable income in this bracket could be much higher. However, you ran out of money at the $4 million mark. So you take 34% for your tax rate, multiply it by $3,665,000, and you will get a tax liability of $1,246,100, right? So those last two brackets are where you paid uh, most of your taxes, right? Now, uh, your total tax liability was $1,360,000. So that is how much taxes you owed. Your taxable income is four million, so if you put one thousand three hundred sixty thousand over four million, that's where you'd get thirty-four percent. So that's why the average rate is thirty-four percent, and that's the blue uh, answer, right? Now, if you look at the uh, the beige or the dark beige brownish answer there, uh, it says thirty-four percent as well. We'll go back up into the chart. You'll see that thirty-four percent is also uh, that same uh, in the tax rate column is also highlighted that same color. Now, why is that? Because if you made one more dollar, if you made four million and one dollars, it would still be in that same marginal tax bracket. So your marginal tax rate is 34%. Okay, so two totally different terms that mathematically just happen to equal 34%. Please note that uh, in any future problems, that's more than likely not going to be the case. Okay. In fact, in almost all cases, your marginal tax rate is usually higher than your average rate because your average rate went through lower tax rates. Uh, whereas your marginal tax rate should be the highest progressive marginal tax bracket you've gotten to. So that's taxes in a nutshell, and you'll obviously um, see some other problems like that in your quiz and also in your test guide. Okay, moving to the last big concept for this lecture is cash flow. Now, cash flow, you know, I can't state this enough, it is one of, if not the most important pieces of information that you'll get from financial statements. It's a very important topic to understand. If you run out of cash, you're going to go bankrupt. Your business is not going to be there. So you really want to make sure that you have a proper understanding of cash flow and how to make sure that you can cover your short-term liabilities. That being said, our focus here is going to be on how cash is generated from utilizing assets and how it is paid to those who finance the asset purchase. Now, to really understand cash flow, you need to have some equations in your back pocket. These, these equations, you may not use them a whole lot in the real world, but if you understand them, at least you know, from a mathematical standpoint, it will really start to help you understand how cash flow flows. Uh, the first one is the cash flow from assets. Now, cash flow from assets can equal uh, operating cash flow minus net capital spending minus changes in networking capital 
Okay, or it could also be cash flow from assets equals cash flow to creditors plus cash flow to stockholders. And if you'll, you know, you know, one of these incorporates operating cash flow, and that's you know a very interesting way of going about getting cash flow from assets. The other looks more like you know the old accounting equation. If you think of assets equals uh, debt plus equity, right? And it's always important to remember cash flow should be positive. Um, unless you're a young company and you're investing heavily for growth and then you got to be careful still that you you know you still got to cover your um, short-term liabilities if you have any now these equations can be somewhat um, hard to understand so let's go ahead and look at an example and then maybe that'll help you start to look and see how cash flows are flowing if you look at the example here you'll see that you can you know calculate each one of the the cash flow from asset equations using information from either balance sheet or the income statement. Now, if you look at the first one, there's a lot more work to do, right? Because you got to get the operating cash flow. Now, the operating cash flow is a unique way to look at cash flow that's generated by the main operations of a company. You're going to start by looking at EBIT or earnings before interest in taxes and then you're going to add back depreciation and you're going to subtract taxes okay now another way of of writing that equation in my opinion is to say instead of EBIT plus depreciation minus taxes is you could have done net income plus depreciation plus interest because really what you're doing is you're taking your net income and you're going to add back depreciation because it's a non-cash item and you're going to add back your interest expense because that's a financing decision not an operating decision but regardless you can use the the OCF or the operating cash flow equation that they've shown there or my specific one which is OCF equals net income plus depreciation plus interest it's up to you now if you can also look at net capital spending and that's the inventory and fixed assets over a period Okay, and you can also look at the change in net working capital, and we know that net working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. So in this case, we would look be looking to see how that changed from 2009 to, to, to 2010. What you know you should see here is where do you get this information from? Well, for the operating cash flow, that all came off of the income statement, but for net capital spending and for changes in net working capital, uh, those that information came from the balance sheet. Okay. Now that's just some math, so plug and chug, and you'll get your answer. You can also use cash flow from assets using the other equation from the previous slide, which I'll show you in here in a second. But notice here that this we calculated cash flow from assets this way is $87. So now let's look at the other slide. All right, when you look at cash flows from assets using this equation, which is using cash flow to creditors plus cash flow to stockholders, you'll see that this information also comes from both the income statement and the balance sheet. So interest paid is something you'll get off an income statement. Dividends paid, that's something you get off of an income statement. However, net new borrowing would come off of the balance sheet and net new equity will come off the balance sheet. You add these together, and, you know, once again, you'll get $87. So you can do, you know, find cash flow from assets either way. I think it's also important to point out that cash flow from assets is sometimes called free cash flow. And the reason I like to say this is because I think it makes it's, makes more sense when you say that this is cash flow that's going to be free to, to distribute to creditors and shareholders because it's not tied up in the net working capital or, fi or fixed assets of a company. So once again, if you're wanting to have somewhat of a cheat sheet to keep you know all of these cash flow formulas in one place, this slide is a good place to go to. And so just use this more as a reference than anything else, but I wanted to put it all in one place for you. So with that being said, I'd like to wrap up this lecture by giving you two slides that ask you some important questions. Uh, both of these slides uh, will ask questions that if you can answer, you're well on your way to understanding lecture 1.3, financial statements, taxes, and cash flow. So here's the first. What is the difference between book value and market value? which should we use for decision-making purposes what is the difference between accounting income and cash flow which do we need to know or do we need to use when making decisions 
What is the difference between average and marginal tax rates? Which should we use when making financial decisions? How do we determine a firm's cash flows? What are the equations and where do we find the information? This should wrap up Lecture 1.3, Financial Statements, Taxes, and Cash Flows.